like this one guy was telling me a story about he his, his his name was Larry. He worked with me. He was one of my uh, helpers that they gave me at the Ford place. And he said that one time down in Houston, you know, when they got these temporary concrete barriers on either side, he was driving through there pretty fast because the traffic was going pretty fast. And he said he got on top of the water on his little Ford Pinto, and um, he went back and forth in between those concrete things, hitting them like a you know pinball machine thing. And he said, whenever I stopped sliding, that thing was a foot shorter on both ends, and it was totaled out. It didn't break any glass or anything, but he said he had just made the last payment on it. You know, Pinto twos, Mustang twos. <laughs> a funny story there. You, know, you can see that happen. But anyway, simplest mistake. This is a war story. If you don't look careful and pay attention to what you're doing, you can have some serious issues that cause you have to pull it back apart. Yes, you know, it can range from anything from having to tear it back down. How many of you guys have ever been putting something back together in here? And you got it back together, all this heavy duty work, transmission back in, all that kind of stuff. And you look over on the floor and that plate that goes between the transmission and the motor is laying on the floor. And you already got it stabbed, you already got bolts in, you got to pull all that junk back out. I mean, it's the easiest thing in the world to forget sometimes. Well, it takes a lot of grit to do what you do. How many of you guys have run into something that was tougher than you thought it was going to be and you just had to keep on keeping on and get done with it? A couple of times. <laughs> you know that? I mean, yeah, really. So what I'm saying is that there's more to it than you think there is. And you gotta be you gotta be tough to do this kind of work. This kind of work is not for lazy wimps. Okay? You gotta you gotta be tougher than the work. And it would be really nice if you could just call somebody over there and say, Hey Joe, can you come finish this job for me while I go sit down somewhere? But that ain't the way that works, you know what I'm saying? Ain't nobody gonna finish it. Transmission technicians worth their salt in a busy shop can make some pretty amazing paychecks. So at home and take them over the end of the week. Now the first transmission I ever built was a 27 torque flat. It's in a 78 uh, Dodge pickup truck. And I had that thing, I pulled that thing out and I started tearing it down. I had never pulled the transmission apart before. Didn't have no books, I just happened to wing it, which I hate doing that. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's best not to do that if you've got literature to go by. And this other guy that had done some transmissions came walking by and he pulled a, a seal out of place that I didn't know about, because it's like I say, the first one I ever done. And he said, oh, look at there, look at that seal. And he threw it aside and he went on his way. And whenever I put it back together, because I didn't pull a seal out of there, I didn't put one back. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yep. All right. All right. So this is the lip seal. That's what he pulled out of there. That's what a lip seal looks like if you look at a cross-section of it. It goes right in here. And he pulled that one out. And when I put it back in, you know, this, these pistons, and this is sort of, you know, this one doesn't exactly go with that, but you know what I'm talking about. There's a seal in there and there's a seal on the outside of this, and the pressure goes in behind this, and it squeezes the springs that are on these stems, and that actually applies those clutches. Well, the reason it had, it, whenever he didn't put that seal back on it, it wouldn't pull out of his tracks after the fluid got hot. It worked just fine until the fluid got hot and thin, where it could go squirting in between there where there was no seal. You know, when the fluid's thick, you know, it's different than it is when it's thin. You had to tear it all back down, and I, I do after I thought about it, what had happened because of the range that it didn't, you know, that it, I mean, that one needed to have. But it's best to keep your hands off somebody else's work unless they ask for help. Unless they ask for your help, stay the heck away from stuff. So you can see people all along, you know, Jonathan, bless his heart, when he was in here, he always wanted to go to get his hands on everybody's work, you know, because he felt like, I know how to do this, so I need to make sure. And, you know, in here we're learning how to do stuff. Getting the job done is one of the objectives, but the other one is you need to learn how to do the work. And, uh, and see, these guys here are already doing work without supervision and doing a good job of it because I've thrown so much stuff at them. You're not doing a good job. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Now, I was talking about uh, the, the, the new guys, you know. Oh. Eli, yeah, they're, I mean, they're already able to do stuff that they didn't know anything about because I've given them the work and they're doing the work and they're learning how to do the work. That's how you learn how to do the work. All right, so this vehicle was a high-mileage Dodge Dakota that came in on the hook because the transmission would barely pull out of its tracks in forward gear. Now, it did a little bit better in reverse, but it still wasn't a proud one, right? So you're, you try to back up, it just barely would move, and it wouldn't already pull out of the track going forward. Okay, it's a, basically, it's a modified 904 torque flat. Now, the transmission you've got torn apart on the bench right now is a 904 torque flat. That's one of the reasons I gave you the transmission to tear apart yesterday, because I'm talking about a transmission that's very similar to it today. All right, so we've got an additional planetary gear set on this one. Yours looks like this, right? The one you're tearing down? Yeah. All right, and this piece back here has got a planetary in it that gives you overdrive. 
69. One big spring back there. Look that thing. Why? Why I threw that right up? Like okay. you said, it uh, won't go in forward, but it'll go vertical. We'll see. I'll show you in a minute. We're, we're headed there. All right. The fluid was dark and smelly. You pull the dipstick out, and the fluid stinks, and it's all dark and gummy and everything. To begin with, that's going to cause varnish. It's going to be on the valves and the valve body, and some of them are going to stick. Sometimes, if you had to service one in a long time and you service it, it starts washing that out. We talked about that the other day, it called choke. And so, basically, there was enough. The pressure test we did showed it had enough line pressure to apply the clutches, but with the fluid and the shape it was in, we just went ahead and jerked the pan off, and it was loaded with all kind of glitter and all kinds of stuff in it. There's nice and fuzzy metal whiskers on the thing and all that. Now this this transmission here is laying on the bench with the pan off, and we actually pull the pan off with it in the uh, truck. Now, incidentally, you can buy these little books online if you're doing a particular transmission that you're wanting to do, you know, and you're actually working on one like you're working on one at home or something. But um, you can actually buy these books right here. And now you saw that book I handed you the other day on there, and it's, it gives you a lot of really really good information if you get the latest one on that. And so we've got some of those books here, uh, and, and I kind of like those. Well, we tore it down and inspected it. See, there ain't very many parts there. This is a fairly not not too complicated thing right here. Okay, okay. The, it was spread out on the bench. There was not a clutch burned anywhere. We couldn't see anything. So, what do you think about that? All the internal hard parts, including hard parts, would be like your planetaries and the, you know the stuff that doesn't have soft rubber or lining on it or something. Uh, they look really good, with the exception that the metal particles were all over the place. So metal particles are telling you what? Something's, Something's coming apart. Right? Something's grinding. All right. All right. So a pizza box is not going to fix this one. You know when a transmission overhaul kit comes, it comes in a flat white box, it looks like you bought a pizza. When you open it up, this is what you see in there. Right? Got all them stuff, all them seals in there. So what's going to do that? There's only one place left to look. Anybody know what it was? Where are we going to look? We already tore the transmission down. Hmm? What's left? What did we not look at? We got it out. We got it on the bench. We tore it down. We didn't see anything. Where did we not look yet? You're close. The torque converter. We didn't look at the torque converter. The torque converter is over here on the bench, but we didn't actually look at it. We just pulled it out and set it over and started turning it down. All right. So I took the front clutch housing with that turbine shaft. You know that part that's got that shaft coming off the front? The paler and all that? Huh? It's got the paler in Well, I stuck it in there into the, put it in here, and the thing was welded together. It was dragging real hard and everything, and you couldn't already get it to turn. I say it was welded, it was totally welded together, but it was all wore out on the inside and, and sort of burned up. Now this right here is the uh, turbine. This is the impeller. These right here are welded together because that's the way they're built. That's a, like a shell around that. And on the inside of this, you're going to see some blades that look like those. When this spins, it throws oil against that and it starts trying to turn that shaft. And this uh, right here gives you torque multiplication. It redirects fluid so it hits it with a maximum. Uh, this torque multiplication comes from that. And it's got a one-way clutch on the inside of it and all that. But anyway, all this was kind of burned out in here. And it was uh, just not working anything like it was supposed to. And so that's why it wouldn't hardly pull off. Torque converter is really important part of it because it transmits the power from the motor to the transmission. And so this is basically where we were on that. Now this right here is a lockup converter. It's a different one. Right now a lockup converter. It's got this big lockup clutch that applies to the front of that, uh, that shell right there that we call the uh, impeller. And basically it's got the same parts all the rest of them, but it's got these in there too. And it's even got little springs, kind of like a clutch does, you know, like a pressure plate. Uh, yeah. But you got, see these little splines in here? Anytime you get a chance, if you're pulling a torque converter out, if you've got a problem with the transmission, you want to look down in there and you want to see what those look like. Now you're going to pour the oil out of it, look down in there with a flashlight. You might be surprised how you'll see these wiped out. These splines in there. What goes right here on this, on this big one? <coughs> Remember the stator support? It's built under the pump. And then down in there is where your turbine shaft That What hooks into that? In your torque converter. Look down in your torque converter. It's going to be, that's this right here. See that? And this right here slides over that. Right. Now then, that was me and my LTD when I was in high school in 1974. Uh, and we did not live in a sepia-toned world, okay? Actually, we had color. 
Okay. <laughs> Just like old guys. Have you noticed when you see the old pictures are always sepia toned, and you're thinking, and if you see a movie where they go back to 1973, they're walking around in a sepia tone, you know, I'm thinking it's not sepia tone then. We everything about the same color as it is now, except it was old. The, top, the picture gets old. That's what it is. All right. Converter destroying factors. Among other things, a loose transmission filter or damaged filter seal can pull air into the fluid supply and cause a failure because of the air bubbles in a torque converter always find their way to the middle because it's a centrifuge. So the, the lightest stuff is going to go to the middle, right? And the heaviest stuff is going to go to the outside. So if you've got a bunch of foam in there, if you've got air in there, and like a, let's say that you cut that O-ring when you're putting that filter on there, you, got a, or you left the gasket off or something like that, you're going to pull air in there and you're going to burn the torque converter up. Now, I don't know that that's what caused on this one, but I mean, that can burn up the torque converter kind of the way this one was burned up. The center part of the torque converter needs lubrication really bad. All right. Something else that happens, if you pull excessively heavy loads, you can wipe out the splines in the torque converter because that's the, probably the weakest part of that whole thing is the splines in the torque converter. It's going to raise the pressure when you're into it heavy, so it's going to apply the clutches good and hard. But the splines in that torque converter are pretty much... I burned, I mean, I ruined the torque converter in a, tor in a car I had one time, pulling another car from Andalusia back to Enterprise back in the, oh heck, it was in 84. And uh, they had the park brake on all the way back. And it, wiped, it destroyed the transmission in the car that I was, I was trying to help them out. You know, I didn't have a pickup at the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, or for some reason, I didn't want to take my pickup. I can't remember what the deal was. I had to haul a bunch of people and they went right in the back. Home. Anyway. Uh, so I had to, you know, put a torque converter in my car and build the transmission. But anyway, pull the, place the line, replace the radiator transmission cooler. If you've got a bunch of metal in a pan and you need to do an overhaul, if you don't, if these line, these things right here that's coming out of the, particularly that's coming out of the torque converter will get in that uh, transmission cooler. And then when you put your transmission in there, like if you put another transmission, if you build that transmission, all of that uh, metal is going to come flushing out of that cooler because a lot of it's going to be in there, which is either in the radiator or it's in front of the radiator. And it's going to go back in there and you're going to wind up with the transmission not shifting right or you'll drive down the road when you come back it'll stay in high gear and the valves will stick in the valve body and you got to pull it apart a bunch of times to clean it. That one guy in the transmission shop was telling me about that. He said, you better put a transmission cooler in that thing or you're going to be working on it for a month trying to get it straightened out. I mean, you literally will. You have to pull that thing apart. They do have filters that you can put in the lines going to the transmission cooler that have magnets in them. For this purpose, they're real expensive. They cost about $25, $30 a pop. They kind of look like a fuel filter, but they're made a little heavier. Uh, but the smartest thing to do is flush the lines and replace the cooler or put a radiator in it, because the radiator don't cost that much. Go ahead and change the radiator, or if it's got an extra cooler, put a cooler on it. I mean, it's just a smart way to do it, you know, and don't try to cut corners. So you, you got to put a pump pump on it to put one? Sir? You got to put a radiator and a cooler? No, no one put them both on there, because usually the radiator has got the cooler in it. If the radiator's got the cooler in it, all you got to do is put the radiator on it. If the radiator don't have the cooler in it and it's got a built-in cooler like some of these Dodge vans, they don't even have the cooler in the radiator. They got it in front of the radiator, kind of like I just showed you that picture. You go replace whatever the cooler is. If it's the radiator, you replace that. If it's the other cooler, you replace that. Well, if you replace or flush the converter, if you've got a situation where the metal's coming from somewhere besides the converter, you need to get it out of the converter. Okay? All right. Now, if you ain't got a machine to flush the converter, and most people don't, and uh, we have one in the Ford place, but if you ain't got one to flush the converter, then don't worry about flushing the dog on the converter, but it's very difficult to get everything out of there. Big trucks, you can take the converter apart. Got a bunch of bolts around there, you can take it apart, clean it that way. Uh, all these cars are all welded together. Besides that, a converter don't cost that much. A converter will usually cost a little over $100 on most cars. Um, okay, now what we got in the converter, we had the wrong converter. We're putting the dirty thing up in there, we found out that the hole wouldn't line up. No matter which way we turned it, the hole wouldn't line up. I mean, it's like on the Dodge, you know, you got to, on a Dodge, it won't typically line up, but on the, on the Dodge, a lot of the Dodges like this vintage, it won't line up but one way. It's got four bolts, you know, but it's actually, it ain't like a Ford. The Ford's got the stud that goes through the plate, and on the Dodge, you basically can turn the converter around and check all, you know, but if you put up three of the bolts in, one of them wouldn't line up. So we had to, when we call the parts guy back, he goes, oh yeah, I know what the problem is. I sent you the wrong converter. Thanks a lot. So he sent us the wrong one. So I used to deal with an old parts guy that we joked around would usually send you the wrong part until he could get you the right one. You know what I mean? I don't have the one you need, but I'll send you a different one. You can hang on to that until I got the right one. I don't know why he thought that way. But he did. <laughs> got a misfire. Got it all put back together. Got it ready to test drive. 
All right? It was really operating good. That transmission was doing everything it was supposed to after we built it. But it had a really bad misfire. So this was actually a picture on that vehicle. You pull a plug wire back and hold it over here, pop, 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 pop. You kind of find that by spraying soapy water on the plug wires. And if you start seeing a spark like that and it's missing, you know you got bad plug wire, right? Okay, and so it felt like it had machine guns mounted on the fenders when it was, <coughs> you know what I'm saying? All right, so I secured uh, the approval and we went after the skip of the wires and the plug and it really needed those. They were pretty bad. So we went out with a misfire in idle even when it wasn't under a load. And as the scope showed that it was running lean there. And the first time I ever saw that was in 1983 at the Volkswagen place, the first time I ever used a scope. And I found one that had a bad fuel filter that had that firing line right there was really ugly because it was having a terrible time keeping that spark there because there wasn't enough fuel. Anyway, it was getting, I, I was going to get this thing straightened out one way or another. And so I drew a number of conclusions about this number two misfire because now it was misfiring at idle. So, you know, and, it, and it got there, that came in it after we, and what, we didn't do anything wrong with the plugs, we double checked all that, the wires were on there, right? Number two cylinder was a guilty party, knew that. And we let the spark jump to the plug, we noticed the spark was always popping even when it was misfiring. So it wasn't that it didn't have spark to that plug. And the injector on cylinder number two was just clicking away, doing everything it's supposed to do. Okay, so it was outfitted with a returnless fuel system, and I'd seen this kind of thing before. The fuel gauge showed less than an eighth of a tank of gas, which is barely above empty. And I took a notice of the fact that the natural engine tilt put the number two injector at the highest point on the fuel rail. So if you've got air coming into a returnless fuel system, it's going to go to the highest part of the rail. And you have a bubble right there in that injector and there ain't going to be no fuel going through it. Got it? Because it was pulling air in through the fuel pump because it was almost out of gas. So like the way the drive was doing that, uh, Very similar. He raised the front of it up, and when he poured the coolant in there, he added how much he had? McBride added probably another uh, half a gallon or more of coolant to that thing after he raised it up. Right, so any of the air bubbles that entered from the rail from an air sucking fuel pump would tend to gather at the mouth of the number two injector and cause a misfire on a cylinder. We put two gallons of gas in it, and that skip went away. That's all we had to do. All right, so this is the return versus the returnless fuel system. See, the return fuel system got a fuel pressure regulator on it, and it actually can do something else with the air besides pushing it through the injector. If you've got a returnless system, the air has got to go through the injector. the only place it can go. And if it happens to be trapped at the highest injector, you know, you're going to have a skip on that cylinder because it's a little bit low on gas. So keep that in mind. All right, so add some gas. Bad news. He came back from a test drive with a long face the next time. The transmission was hung in high gear. There was metal in the valve body, and it called for a total redo, and we found it pretty quick. This is what happened. See them needle bearings? They came all to pieces, the one that he put on there. See how the needle bearings are made on that side and on that side? This is the same needle bearing over and over again. See that? And you can put those on backwards. Now, they're skinny. They're flat. And you might feel like it doesn't matter which way you put them on, but if you put them on the wrong way, you're going to have some serious issues, and he had a serious issue. And besides that, he had to clean the valve body a lot of times to get all the gears and everything out of this. He had to keep pulling it out and putting it back, because that metal gets everywhere. You know, and you try the best you can to wash it all out, and it's just a, it just turned into a disaster because of that. Now see that one there? That's the one that he put in there. And he put it in there, that, that's the way it's supposed to go. You see how it, when it's, it's rolled up on that inside edge? And what he did was he laid it in there the other way, not the way you see it, but he laid it down the other way because he felt like it was, he didn't have a lot of experience, and he felt like, well, this is going to be just like a washer. It doesn't matter which way I put it. Bad deal. All right. This is wrong. This is right. You get it? Wrong, right, wrong, right. Pay attention to that. The inside of that thing needs to be against that inside part of that, and the outside, it needs to be carrying that load. Now, you can tell how putting it together like that would be a bad idea, because all it does is just grind it and tear it all to pieces. It ain't even able to carry the load that way. Now, one more error. Maybe you can pay attention on your teardown. Pay attention when you're tearing one down, because you've got to watch how this thing comes apart. It's really important. On that particular transmission, you know, this looks right, doesn't it? I don't see anything wrong with that, do you? But this is actually what's supposed to be in there on that one. 
that little wire. Now that's real unusual because you don't use it in. Most of the time you see stuff like this right here. And he put that in there, and that turned out when we were going back through it, we found that he had put that in there and he was supposed to have that in there. See how perfectly that fits? But that little thin snap ring would fit in there too. And it was about the right size. <laughs> And so he put that in there. But this is the right way and that's the wrong way on that. But that particular transmission. The point is, if you're pulling it apart, you watch what you're doing when you're pulling it apart and having this attitude like, well, I'll just pull off the part and throw it on the bench and I'll figure it out when I'm going back in. Mm -mm. You know, you ever tried that? That don't work, does it? What mm -hmm. happens? You got a war story? You didn't leave something out. And or you, you put, put the wrong backwards. piece in the wrong place. Or you just ruin everything. We don't want to, we don't want to ruin things, do we? Have, have you ever have I'm you ever ruined anything? Have. I have. You have. I'll tell you yeah. what, did you ever put a piston in backwards? Yes, I put a whole set in backwards in a Volkswagen bug engine one time, and it was. Uh, it's been a while since I built a bug. My dad had, was a bug mechanic, and I called him and I said, "This engine's knocking." And he says, "You put the pistons in backwards, didn't you?" I said, "Which which way is it? Wait a oh, crud! I'm always thinking that the belts are the front." Well, on a Volkswagen bug engine, the flywheel's at the front. Well, I'm glad, no, I'm not the only one that put a yeah. piston in the backwards. And it was, but I will tell you this, when it was knocking because the pistons were in backwards, that thing would outrun the tar out of when it was put together right. It was a little rail buggy I built with my buddy on the weekend because it was his vehicle. Did and it, it, would jerk, it would jerk the front wheels three feet off the ground when he took off when that motor was put together wrong. I mean, did it, did it survive? Did you have to rebuild we it? We pulled it back down and put the pistons in there right. Okay. But the simple fact was it didn't knock anymore, but it didn't have as much power either. And he told me, he said, it'll outrun the stew out of one that's put together right. If you don't care what happens and you're going to outrun somebody that's built a stock engine, put the pistons in there back there and it'll run like a spotted eight. And that did one on a two-stroke <laughs> motorcycle and it, it didn't survive. It seized yeah, up. It crossed up and came apart. It busted. It come all yeah. apart. Yeah, that's engine stuff there. All right. The rules apply to just about everything. Know what you're looking at when you look at the parts. If you're taking something apart and you don't know what it is you're looking at, you know what I mean? It's a good idea. Like, for example, let me ask you this. Let's say you tore the transmission down, like the one you're working on. I'll dip into I don't know what I was looking at. Yeah, well, that's why you're looking at, that's why you're looking at the stuff that's in your literature so you can tell what it is. Well, here, how about this? Let's say that you took it all apart and you laid it out real pretty on the table just like it was supposed to go and you remembered how to go back. But you're going to have to have this part and you're going to have to call the guy and tell him what you need. What you gonna tell him? I need this little round thing. It's got this stem on it. You know, uh -uh. that ain't how that works. You better get your exploded view with the numbers in the book, and you need to say item number forty-two on this page is the reaction sun shell, or you know, the, you know, the forward clutch drum, or whatever. You know what I mean? Or this particular piston. You know, like, so what I'm saying, if you if you know what to tell him, I need a pizza box, and I need a forward clutch drum. And I need this other part. You know, the, the, if you tell them, and I need a governor, you know, whatever, if it's an older transmission. All right, don't try to wing it on one you're not familiar with. Get in the book first and find out all you can and then follow the instructions. You know? I mean, like, all of us, like, I've noticed that one person who shall remain nameless that was tearing an engine down one day, he goes there, it's like, see a bolt? Take it out. You know, let's just do this. Instead of taking it apart the right way, he just saw, looked at the bolt that was right on top, and that's what he started taking out. And that's not the right way to do that. You take it apart the wrong way. And I have had people do that when they're putting it back together, just trying to wing it, and they wind up getting in trouble because they're saying, oh, no, this is not going to work now. I'm going to pull all this back apart and put that in. I wish I'd have been reading. Or that one guy's pulling a motor out of this little uh, Kia uh, Sportage out here. He gets the motor part way out, trying to pull it out the top, and then he finds that it won't come out the top on that particular one. It's got to go out the bottom, and the transmission and the motor was already separated, and they were flopping around in there. That was not good. Or this other guy that came from uh, one of these, uh, what used to be National Auto Diesel College, he just had to motor out an Explorer with the Ford place. And, you know, of course, he had the belt off, the fans turning this way and that and all around and around. He goes, I'm, he said, the fan won't let me get the motor out of here. He says, and it's hanging from the chain and all this. He goes, how can I get the fan off of this thing with it just spinning freely like that? Think about it. It's a problem solving, man. You know, heck, I guess this was in 1993, and uh, and I says, Justin, he's working, he, he, he still works over there. I says, uh, you got a you got a box of snap on duels there, yeah. And I asked him if he had one particular item. He goes, yeah, I got that. I said, you ever use it? Uh -uh. So I got his air hammer, 
and I set it against the flat on there, bam, broke it loose, we screwed it off. <laughs> well, see, he had an air hammer, but he didn't know the significance of what you use it for. Because inertia is working for you when you're doing something like that. Anyway, but I mean, see, the thing about it is he didn't think about pulling the fan off. He gets the motor part way out and it's swinging from the chain. He says, how can I fix this? Because it's against the radiator or, or the something. I can't remember. It was against something that wouldn't let him out. Of course, you he couldn't pull the radiator. Now, pay attention to how it comes apart, what knows where, and in what order, and look at everything. Now, when Jonathan was building that, uh, he was building a transmission uh, for that one Dodge that we got over here. He pulled it all apart. He did the pizza box thing, and he put it back together, and it worked, but it didn't work right. And so I had him pull it out and tear it down again, and there was a bunch of parts in there that were wore out. And all you had to do was put them together, and you could tell they were wore out. You can even see where they've been to each other. The little bushings on the inside of some of the drum were actually worn out, and it was just banging around in there, and it wasn't going to work right because he missed those parts. And then I called Gary over there in, in Dauphin at uh, Transpro, and he said, why don't you just let me get you another transmission for that thing? And he, he found me a transmission for like $300, <laughs> and uh, that was less than the parts would have cost to fix it. And so we popped the transmission in, and that's what's, that's what's in it now, that, that Dodge that we have here. But anyway, realize that if you fail to follow these rules, you'll cost yourself a lot of extra work and won't make as much money. Okay? And what I was telling you this morning, when you're out there working on something and your new boss man's watching you, if you're walking like you're late for an appointment, you're getting a lot of work knocked out, then he'll start giving you better and better work and he'll start paying you more money, typically. You know what I mean? So you got to act like you're got, your heart's got to be in it, what I've got to say. Uh, you ever see somebody doing something your heart's not in it? I mean, they're just sort of going through the motions and all that kind of stuff. Leaving in the middle of the day and all that kind of stuff. All right. All right. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> yeah. He had a good shot. He had to.